Hello, I'm Michael Parker and welcome to Antidote. One of the biggest stories of the 21st century is the privatization of public natural resources. Land, water, forests, even clean air have become valuable assets in otherwise stagnant economic times. In response to this development and sell-off of all of this public property, the people are rising up and they're organizing with things like Occupy the Land and the Food Justice Movement. We're going to be talking about these and many more today with producer-director Todd Darling. He has created the documentary Occupy the Farm. Todd? Michael. Welcome to Antidote. Thank you very much. So you came to my attention via um, another television producer. He told me what you were doing. I was very intrigued. I looked up the documentary. I watched it a couple of weeks ago. And then this article came out a couple of weeks ago in the LA Weekly about the Coastline Commission. So this idea of this misappropriation of public land and public resources, that's what this is all about generally, right? Yeah. I, I, it was not the first idea I had in my mind when I started this film, in truth, but it was what I discovered right, you know, two steps in the door. This is what I found out. I originally came to this topic. I had been researching urban farmers in Oakland. Uh, areas in, in Oakland, there are areas that are like eight square miles, 20,000 residents, zero grocery stores. And people in these communities had started little pocket farms and, and abandoned lots and whatnot. And they were you know, giving, the, growing the food for themselves, first of all, and then distributing it to their neighbors. And that sort of took off as a movement. And I was interested in doing something about that in a film or a TV show. And then the Occupy movement happened. Mm -hmm. I was in front of Oakland City Hall and I saw some of the people running the kitchen at Occupy Oakland were the same people I'd met who are the farmers in West Oakland. I thought, uh, these people and those people, they're going to get together at some point because land is scarce and that will make a great movie. I wait six months and sure enough, I get a text. These people, 200 urban farmers are marching down San Pablo to a piece of public land, and they're carrying with them 15,000 seedlings. They crack the padlock off the gate, march in, clear two acres, and start planting the food. And so I got, when I heard about this, called up some friends, they went over there right away, I got there as soon as possible, and then just followed it as a story. And then it turns out that the land that they had occupied was a publicly owned research farm owned by the University of California, and it had been a research farm for the last 80 years, and they were planting crops on this land in order to save the land from becoming a real estate development. So that's, so then I realized like, oh, this is about people saving a public resource for the purpose of farming when it had only been a farm, and it was surrounded by an urban area, and without this research farm, the, you know, this research farm had like a, given its location, could really play an interesting and critical role you know, in, in, in the state of our economy and the state of our environment right now. So it was a really fascinating story and then I started thinking about like all the public resources that are being poached by private interests for, you know, private gain. This particular tract of land, the Gill Tract, explain, now this is part of UC Berkeley. Yeah. Correct? Okay, so this land came to be theirs because UC Berkeley is a land grant university. Explain what that is. Back in the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln signed an act of Congress for land grant colleges because there weren't such a thing as like public universities, but they created uh, this land grant act to create public universities that would be accessible to the common person to go to school for a very low amount of money. But all of these land grant universities had to promise to teach agriculture and mechanics. Yeah. And so, so the, in, the, um, in the very DNA of the University of California at Berkeley, they are a land grant college. Each state was given a certain number of acres. They could sell it off in order to raise the money to finance the creation of a university. And that's how the University of California came to be. And there are land grant colleges in all 50 states of the United States, and it's the foundation of public universities in America. So they are required to teach agriculture. And this piece of land, the Gill Tract, is their last farm anywhere close to the university. So if they pave it over and there's no farming, they're in breach of their charter 
a charter signed by Abraham Lincoln. Understood. Well, I tell you what, let's get everybody on board here by showing them the trailer of the film. This is really good stuff. If we can roll that, we will get back to the maps. We'll show everybody the, the property, but let's roll the trailer right now. This is called Occupy the Farm. It's inherently hopeful to plant a seed because you hope that it grows. Who's far? The people have taken over the land and tried to rescue it. We brought up the rototillers, then we brought up the compost, and then we brought up the plants, and it was just like, wow, we're really doing this. You are trespassing. We are ordering you to leave. We will regain control of that property. Earth Day demonstration is turning into a standoff between occupiers and UC Berkeley. This is a fight about the allocation of an asset. Land. It's the last really prime soil in the East Bay to grow food on. This is where the proposed Whole Foods would be. It's not just a Whole Foods, but it's also an assisted living center for senior citizens, and I believe some retail space. If they're left to their own devices, the guild tract will be reduced to a garden box. We believe this land should be permanently preserved for urban agriculture. They think a public asset means they can use it the way they want to use it. It's really not the way we look at it. Our main concern is water right now. The university actually shut off our water. What we're going to be doing is handing buckets over the fence. At about 6 a.m., we were woken up by some police over the megaphone. Force would be used against them if necessary, and that force could have included chemical agents. The university escalated the impacts, filing a lawsuit against 15 named individuals. You say it's a scare tactic. Does it scare anybody? Well, we're committed to farming this land, and we're going to stay here and keep farming. I need control back of this site. Somebody ran by saying, cops, riot cops, lots of riot cops. This is public lands. We are giving it away. What they have done is given a wake up call to the whole community. The whole point of this is to not talk about what we want and to not demand what we want, but to make what we want real. And this community, this community will not abandon that farm. Who's far? Our farm. That is the trailer for Occupy the Farm. Todd, let's reiterate this piece of land that we're talking about, the Gill Track. Now we're down to 20 some odd acres. Originally it was part of 100 acres, but they've already developed or sold off the other 80, so this is what they have left. Now of the 20 acres that is in question in this film, before we get to how everybody came on board to, to farm it and things, part of the field was being, part of this land was being used by the university, but not all of it. Yeah, most of that, the remaining 20 acres, it was lying fallow. There was nothing happening on it. A portion of it was being farmed and had been farmed for 50 years by various agricultural researchers. There was actually, for half of a century, there was a pre, like the premier organic farming research facility was there. And they were finding ways to eradicate pests without using chemicals or, or, or poisons. That program ended in the mid-90s, and right after that, there was a process where the land sort of fell into disuse. Um, it went, was transferred from an academic department to the capital projects department. Uh, they brought in a lot of people doing corn research, which, which was for the aim of genetic research. Mm -hmm. It was not genetically modified corn, but they were doing genetic research on corn in order to make GMOs. And so the, 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 the mission of it totally changed. And it, uh, so now it, it, all of the research that had been done there had been given away for free because it's a public university. Mm -hmm. And the emphasis to the research in the last 10 years, what limited research there was going on there, was principally for the aim of coming up with patents that they could sell to a corporation. So it, the whole thing changed a lot. And there were links to Monsanto. Uh, the, the, Monsanto is one of the companies that, that has bought patents from resulting research from the, the Gill Tract at the University of California, Berkeley. Understood. So this land, the, the remaining acreage that was not being used, mm -hmm. the surrounding community had appealed to the university 
can we do something here? Can we start some urban agriculture and the university was just not interested or they kept denying? What, there, were, there had been multiple attempts to negotiate with the university. Can't we do research here? Can't we have community gardens? Can't we do something positive? We're a land-grant college. Why do why, why you want to pave this over? What's going on here? And there had been th at least three attempts to negotiate with the community, but nothing was happening. It went nowhere. And, and each time, it looked like they were going to sign something, that some positive step was going to be taken. And then, then they, they stepped back, the university stepped back from that and just canceled and people were very frustrated. So when the Occupy movement came along, suddenly there was this tactic. It's like, okay, we know that we're right. We know that this is what the, fun, the farmer's point of view. Yeah. We know that the law says that this is supposed to be for public research sure. and it's supposed to be agriculture. We just need to, to farm it. We're not going to ask for it. We're not going to demand it. We're going to do it. So they march on and they start farming it. It got a ton of TV exposure and local news. And then suddenly the, the university had to deal with the actual fact. It was like, hey, someone's there farming it. Suddenly this becomes a nightly story in the news. And the fact that it embarrassed the university into admitting, well, yeah, we're supposed to be using this for farming. We're not really supposed to be developing it as a condos mm -hmm. in a shopping center. And I think that dynamic uh, pushed them in a way that a negotiation never would because they had, you know, hundreds of people out there. And television cameras. And television cameras, little kids planting zucchini, and it just, it, it completely threw them off balance. So April 22nd of 2012 yeah. is when the padlocks were broken and 200 people or 100 people? 200, 200 people is what, the, it was what they say. I wasn't there at that, at that moment, and, but they did have 15,000 seedlings. So they come in, seeds, seedlings, water, manpower, the community's ready, and they clear two acres in the first day or so? They, right, exactly. They, they cleared more than an acre the first day, planted almost an acre, and then over the, the, you know, the next few days, cleared over two acres and planted it completely with crops. It was very impressive. I mean, it was a lot of work, and they did it fast. And they came in with rotor tillers, and they did this without any money. These are not rich people. There was no organization behind this. This no community, one, Albany, California, is not a is not a rich community. That's a it's a it's a small community right next to Berkeley. Uh, the farm is on San Pablo Boulevard. Okay. San Pablo Boulevard starts in Oakland and runs through Berkeley and runs all the way into Richmond. And so it's a main boulevard, main thoroughfare. And there's a number of communities along it. So within four miles, on either end of of the gill tract are these huge food deserts where there are no grocery stores. So let's land stop. is very, I mean, it's, it's a very urban area. Very let's, let's stop on that. You use the word food desert <coughs> because at one point they're driving through the town and in a lot of, unfortunately, downtrodden areas, there's plenty of liquor stores, ain't no grocery stores. Yeah. And this, this land in the East Bay is some of the last remaining land. So these people want to grow some food. Right, right, right. No, it, there's there's lots of communities. If you you know need some stout malt liquor, it's readily available. <laughs> if you want a tomato, you're going to have a hard time. You know, and and I think that that just you know that that fact of life is 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 the origin of of urban farming mm -hmm. in, in many respects, and that this place, the idea that the premier public university was going to pave over its last research farm amidst this level of urban hunger it was, I think, alarming and upsetting to a lot of people. And that's why it embarrassed the university so much. Well, the university, they were looking at it from the point of view, and you treat the university fairly, I believe, in the documentary because you allow Thank them you. to have their say. And what they're saying is that, look, you know, uh, they're treating this like public property when, in fact, it's our property. And I guess they're thinking we can make more money by developing this land for con, I, I guess there's an assisted living care. If we could bring up the map that shows what they had intended to do. We want to have a portion of this land for an assisted living uh, facility, yeah. a Whole Foods, and what's some just typical shops and things of that nature. Right, right. And, then, and then a whole bunch of condos. And a bunch of condos. 300 condos. 
<laughs> so, yeah. And, and on land given under the premise that it is going to be used for agricultural education and mechanical education. Right, right. So, yeah, they were, they were embarrassed by this Pushback. becoming, yeah, right, be, becoming, becoming public. And, and initially it was going to be a, a Whole Foods, and so Whole Foods was going to build a shopping center on the premier, the, the, the site where the premier organic research program had existed for 50 years. And they were fully aware of this? I don't know what they were aware of. They're just not. looking they, at property, probably. I, and thinking. Yeah, I, I, I can't say about that, but and I can't say exactly what machinations was happened. Yeah, right, because they, they would not speak to me. However, when, uh, uh, spoiler alert, uh, when they pulled out of the project, I asked them for comment, and they said, they sent me, they said, well, we'll send you the original press release. And I thought, well, that's a funny thing. You can send me the original press release. Why? I mean, you know, so I, I get it and I look at it and I didn't really think very much of it. And then in the editing process, I was looking at the dates and I came to realize that the public did not find out about the Whole Foods pulling out of the deal until after a couple of key announcements were made by the university. So they, 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 they withheld the information from the public for almost two weeks. And, I, and it, so as to sort of dress up the situation. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, so yeah, there's a lot of backroom stuff that happens with real estate deals. It's very mysterious. Well, let's talk about what happened with the people who went in there. So you've got 100, 200 people. They're all from the neighboring community. You mentioned that they're like 15 minutes bike rides. So all these people are, they've gathered there voluntarily. Yeah. And they're deciding how we're going to um, till and, and care for this land. First of all, on the third day, the university shuts off the water. How did that go? Well, you know, this is a university facility. It's, it's been farmed. They've got they've got their hands on the levers of everything, right? Yeah. And uh, so they thought, well, these people want to farm. Let's just turn off the water. Let's see what they do then. And and of course, the the farmers, you know, they're they're uh, you know, they flip out. And they're like, well, how are we going to how are we going to do this? And within about 24 hours, you know, neighbors with pickup trucks showed up and said, "We've got this tank. We'll just deliver you water." And then it became a series of people volunteering their trucks to take these 300-gallon uh, tanks in the, in the bed of a flatbed or a pickup, drive around. Neighbors would volunteer their water. They'd fill it up. They'd drive it back onto the land. And then they would you know, pour this water off into like one-gallon or two-gallon jugs. And then people would go out and water two acres of crops plant by plant twice a day. And they rotated the whole thing. So just imagine you're watering two acres with a, with a jug, pouring water on it. It took a lot of people. So when the university cut the water off, instead of being like the thing that killed them, it actually wound up being the thing that expanded the whole project. Strengthened, strengthened their resolve all in the sudden, project. All, these, all of a sudden, all these kids start showing up. And all of a sudden, people would come there after work, and it was it became a, it became a much, uh, you know, a much more notable thing. Do we have some? Can we bring up one of the photos where they're holding this very very heavy, large container of water? I mean, water's heavy. You point that out. <laughs> you point heavy. that out in the film. I mean, these this is a lot of this took a lot of effort. You're lifting the water yeah. over the fence. So already the university is trying to combat this. They try to turn off the water. That doesn't really work. And then there's a police raid as well. Yeah. Yeah. So there, every day, there were several times a day, the police would come on with a bullhorn and announce that everyone was trespassing. And then if, the, if you don't leave, you, you would be subject to arrest. And people would be going about the business of, you know, taking care of the encampment there for the farmers. And there would be little kids running around. And it was sort of, a, it was sort of absurd. I mean, it had, and even the, the police would sort of laugh at themselves as it they did it. has a carnival-like atmosphere a little bit. It was, it sounds odd. But it was a very happy event. It was a very creative thing because it people, looked very fun. People, had, you know, they, people don't often get the, the the chance of try to you know a right or wrong. You know, city hall is too big to fight, and here they are getting to plant something in the ground, intrinsically fun. Mm -hmm. Little kids get to be there. They, the organizers, um, said to me, if my one of them said to me, if my kids can't be here, I don't want to. I'm not coming back. 
So the whole action was designed to be was designed to be kid friendly. Mm -hmm. So the other police, twice a day, with a bullhorn, little kids running around, you're trespassing. But then steadily they ratcheted up their tactics. Mm -hmm. And eventually they, they raided the, the, the land and locked up some of the gates and started padlocking some of the other gates and made it harder and harder to access the land, ultimately closing it all off, padlocking it all. And that's when the farmers had to start l physically lifting the water up over a six foot fence. Um, and then the farmers built a slide to get over. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then there was a, uh, and then finally, a riot police arrived and evicted them. But that, that took that took three weeks. That took three weeks. Okay, so at this point, the riot police they, they evict them for three weeks. The university begins to have meetings, I guess, to decide what they're going to do. They kind of make a little bit of gestures to the occupy the farm people. But tell us what ends up happening as a result of this. By putting all this stuff in play. It exposed like the the fractures in the institution, the University of California, because it turns out not everyone wanted to build on this land, and so then the the public pressure starts to sort of crack their facade, mm -hmm. and it became possible suddenly for the people who didn't want to build on it to begin with to suddenly to gain some traction, gain some traction, and then Whole Foods pulls out of the real estate deal, so the big money's gone away, so now they've embarrassed, so they're not gonna make any money on it. They've fractured their own institution, and suddenly things are in play, and this is the moment when, when actually the decision was made to give half the land back to the researchers, not to pave it, to, and, then, and then ultimately that developed uh, into a situation where a couple of acres were given to a community farm on those 10 acres and now occupy the farm along with people in the community and university staff and professors are running a community farm there. But it, it sort of, if they hadn't occupied the land and pressed the point physically with their bodies and physically grown food there, they would have never started on this, this process that sort of broke up the log jam that made it possible for the land to be saved. Now they didn't save all the land. There's still half of it still, that they still want to pave over the other half. But it's a remarkable thing to think that people with no money, just normal citizens, were smart enough and creative enough to, to do this, pull it off, have the stamina, and essentially match wits with the University of California, and, and from my view, beat them. They self-organized and they pulled all these people together and then they all had a vote on what they were going to do and they had certain people that would deliver the message, certain people would do particular jobs. I think I've heard you say um, somewhere else though that this situation with land-grant colleges, this is not just happening out here. This has happened in, in other schools as well where they're just selling the land off for the property value, the real estate. Right, no, this is happening all over. This is happening coast to coast. And I think it's, I mean, everyone is experiencing this. I mean, I, I probably, many of the people watching this have seen their post office be sold off. They've seen the, you know, the, the public school has become a charter school. They've seen just one thing after another, some public, resource, asset, thing, go into private hands or become more privatized. And, and this is a global phenomenon and we can see it here in the United States and land grant colleges. I've not encountered a single land grant college since making the film where people have not said, oh yeah, we've lost our land. They've given it away. And when you say lost our land, do they mean that we've just pretty much lost lost all of it, or we've lost a majority of it, or lots of it? I mean, it's 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 been it's been diminished, and it's, it's the process has been diminished, and the real estate value is just worth more in the future. That's essentially it. I mean, I, I asked the university, I said, like, isn't this like short term thinking? Like, you're going to short term. You're going to for actually not that much money. You had some money. It's it's, yeah. it's valuable. But it's on a short term. Like you really are gonna. You can only sell it one time. You only sell it one time. We're gonna pave it. It's gonna be paved. I mean, you've already been here for 150 years. I mean, you're gonna. We expect you to be here for another 150 yeah. years. You really are gonna do this? And they, mm, they didn't, never had a very satisfactory answer to that question. And the other infuriating thing about this is that in many of these universities, I mean, everyone knows how much it costs to go to college right now. Yes. And 
and then they're selling their resources away and and it still costs a lot of money it's just it blows on so many levels <laughs> right I mean, well you know it becomes it becomes an easy thing for them to do if you if you run down the institution if you don't raise the taxes for it and you don't run it effectively and it becomes impoverished then it's always in a position of begging and then it becomes easier to say well you don't have any money if we're impoverished we're going to raise tuition and we're going to sell off this this and this right and they've, they've given they've themselves an excuse by basically managing by mismanaging the institution to begin with mm -hmm. so if we impoverish public institutions this is what we can expect so you know if you want to there is no free lunch you right want to, you want to drive on a road without potholes if you want your kid to go to a decent school you know we all have to contribute to that right. doesn't come free and and at the same time it also has to be well managed sure the problem is now that some of the people who are managing it are how are they benefiting from it where's the what are they getting and i think people need to look at who is benefiting from the privatization of public resources across the board agreed and that is your major point with this film and others um there was a point i was going to ask you about um 2016 this is still not sorted out because no. I don't know if we ever brought up the, the, the current map that shows how they're going to develop the tract, Gill tract. Because, okay, Whole Foods pulls out. Yeah. And some of the land, half of the land has been given over back to have these community farms and the research. Yet, this, this store, Sprouts, mm -hmm. is talking about building a store there. I guess the assisted living and the, the condos are back on the table as well. Well, in 2016, um, they started excavation for the foundation of um, a high-end old folks condo, and it's it's a very it will be a very expensive place to live, and uh, and that's on the southernmost chunk of mm -hmm. the land, and then and I'm not sure how far they've gotten with the construction, but there's been some some excavation at least. Then just north of that, Sprouts wants to put a grocery store. And they've not done anything about that yet, and I've not. There's been no construction of it. And then to the north of that is the is the remaining farmland, and it's still being there's the occupy the farm and its supporters are still protesting. Mm -hmm. They're they're raising a lot of food as well. I think I read that they've raised literally tens of thousands of pounds of oh, yeah. food now yeah. for the community. Yeah. No, you can raise. It's astounding with the right education, the right land, the right water. And you a small can raise, amount of land. Small it's amount of land. not you can very raise big. A, you can raise a lot of land. 15% of the total global food supply comes from urban farms. Not big, giant plantations hundreds of miles away, but food grown within very close to a, to a city, 15% of the food you know, originates there. And the amount of open land that is in even fairly dense cities, like a place like Oakland, mm -hmm. There are a thousand acres in Oakland that are publicly owned and unoccupied, where something different could happen on them. So the notion of very intensive agriculture happening within an urban area is not a pipe dream. It's not crazy at all. It can happen. Lowers the carbon footprint of the delivery of your food, um, obviously increases the freshness of it, and, and you might also be winding up doing it yourself, and it's, a, it's an enjoyable thing to do. I've heard it go under different names, the food sovereignty movement. I've heard it called the food justice movement. I mean, it's on. It's yeah. happening. And I think it's very exciting. I think it's a great way to bring a community together. Mm. Um, it, it gives things back to the community. Now, I'm also hearing we have another situation here in L.A. out mm -hmm. in Boyle Heights. Yes. And you guys, I'm going to not pronounce this correctly, but... Proyecto Jardin. Proyecto Jardin. Okay, and that is Minor, on that, marginally better. <laughs> um, that's on land that is adjacent to the White Memorial Medical Center. Yeah, that's it. Tell me about that. That's it. I don't. I'm not an expert on this, but there's a a, a, a garden, a, a small farm that's been there for decades, and it is on land that's owned by um, the the hospital. And now the hospital wants to do something with it. 
but it's a, the contradiction the hospital faces is, of course, here's the neighborhood growing food for its own health. The hospital is supposed to be interested in health, so the hospital is going to bulldoze the garden for a, a building. So it's a it's a parking stand, spaces or parking something. Spaces. So it's a standoff right now between the the, the health providers yes. and the people who are growing healthy food. From what I understand, they have been asked. Um, that they now do have to turn over the land back to the land owner, but the the project people are asking for some ad additional time to try to work around this. But I bring it up just because this is another example of this land occupation, food justice movement, uh, pardon the pun, taking root. Yeah, no, I mean, it's going on, it's going on all over the country. I mean, it, there's like, I'm constantly hearing about, you know, something happening in Oakland, something happening in Santa Cruz, something happening out of state. It's going on in a lot of places. We don't hear about it. Mm -hmm. so these aren't big news stories. Um, like I met a woman who, there was an abandoned piece of land that was probably, you know, like half of a, of, a, of a house lot, you know? And the neighborhood had taken it over years ago and planted an orchard on it and gardens. And now the city wants to take it back. Mm -hmm. and, you know, this is not a story you hear about, but it'd be these these, Little pieces of land become like a focus for the community, mm -hmm. and it's a very, it's a very, at this moment right now when the economy is in such precarious condition for most people, and the resources have been concentrated in so few hands, this is a very tangible way for people to do something for themselves, close to home, and I guarantee you, within a 15-minute bicycle ride of where everybody lives, is some public resource that is being abused, misused, could be put to a better use. And uh, a story like this sort of is a very, it exemplifies a very creative, hopeful way of addressing a, a, a social yes. ill, and as well as doing something good for yourself. It feels good. These it was, guys had a lot of fun doing this. It was positive, it was nonviolent, it had a, productive result. I mean, you're feeding people and you're bringing people together. One of the most important things that I'm getting from your work is you're talking about the idea that really all of this gets back to this misappropriation of public resources. About three weeks ago, um, I can't even read this, this is the March 4th issue of the LA Weekly. And this is about selling the coast. And one of the things that I heard about you from my friend, Donald, was that you know you were quite astute and on, on kind of keeping tabs on this Coastline Commission as well. Now, they've just fired their executive director, Charles Lester. Mm -hmm. And I guess he serves at the pleasure of this commission of 12 that's all politically appointed. Yeah. But you point at that, and then also the South Coast Air Quality Management District, they fired their executive director as well. Right. And in both cases, I guess you're saying that this is done pretty much under pressure from outside forces, usually um, in the marketplace. Yeah. I, it, the idea in California of proposing that we undid the Coastal Act that protects the coast, that would be a bad people, idea. Tell people what that is. In 1972, California voted to, by wide margin, voted to protect the coast. We have an 1,100-mile coastline. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world, yep. as you and I know. Yep. Um, and they voted to protect it so that the public would always have access to it 24-7. The, the beach is ours. You have access to the ocean. And also to sort of control it so that there would not be overdevelopment. So you could see it. They wouldn't despoil it. Um, and then they set up a commission to sort of oversee you know, what development happened. And then to interpret the science and the law, they have a staff, and the staff makes, looks at projects and ideas and recommends to the commission, and the commission votes. So the continuing bureaucratic scientific staff is headed, was headed by this guy, uh, Charles Lester. And the political appointees who sit on the commission voted to fire him without giving any, they, there was no reason offered that sounded like he should be fired. There was no cause. He hadn't done something right. horrible. And I believe it was a five to seven vote. It I was think. a very close vote. Yeah, it was a close vote. And the people who voted, the people who voted against him and voted to fire him included people who are lobbyists for development interests, mm -hmm. for refineries, for desalination plants, for building interests. Yes. So it's, it's kind of naked. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of obvious. But they didn't attack the law. They just found a way to subvert it. 
and you know? and and the way, at least from this article, and what I'm taking from what you're saying is, and this this Charles Lester, he is hesitant to say that he was booted by you know some cabal of oh, yeah, interests, right. but maybe he's just being a gentleman about it, but. It clearly looks like that's what happened, and the guy before him, um, I can't think Peter of his. Douglas. Yeah, now apparently that guy was an OG. I mean, right, he, right. He, was a, <laughs> he was he was a tough guy. He was he there was for like guy. 25 years. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, where do we go from here? What happens now? I, you know, it, it's it's all up in the air, and and uh, and the same thing happened as you said to the the, the air quality district. Where they fired the people who are lobbyists for refineries. Got the when did this direct, happen? That was like two or three weeks ago. So this is, all go, this is all this is all going down now. First quarter, twenty sixteen. But it's I, but, I, but I want to emphasize though that yeah, this is happening in California. But I guarantee you, it's happening in Ohio and Kentucky and Oregon. It's happening everywhere. It's like it's this. These public resources, I mean, who controls the air? Who controls the coast? The California coastline is some of the most valuable real estate in the world. So it's a very valuable plum. There is no private beach in the state of California. Is that correct? I mean, because the idea is it's all supposed to be public beach. Right. You can own the land next to the beach. Yeah. But where the water, where the tide comes in, that is public. You can always be on that, be in, in the median tidal area. So you, you can always walk along the beach. And there, there has to, and the Coastal Commission in California regulates that there has to be regular beach access pathways from public streets down to the beach. So you can't be denied access to the beach. There has to be some access to it. Right. Well, the last point I want to make um, that that you bring up, which is fascinating to me, and I alluded to it in the intro, is that in a time of stagnant economies, where does all the smart money and the big money want to go? Public resources. It's the low-hanging fruit. You know, it is. It's like, it's like what, I mean, the University of California, in the case of the Gill Tract, uh, the University of California has been built by public money for 150 years. It's the biggest research university in the world. So why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't a public corporation want to piggyback on top of the taxpayers' institution to do the research? Why wouldn't you know billionaires who are investing in real estate? Why wouldn't they want to subvert the Coastal Commission to be able to develop coastal land? Mm -hmm. It's just why wouldn't someone want to take the prime real estate of the post office and turn it into you know their own, their own office? It, it's these are very valuable assets that the public has created or preserved or are supposed to be accessible to us all. It was set aside for the public. Set aside for the public and being able to capture those things and put them into private hands is it's a huge, huge benefit. They can spend a few million dollars lobbying politicians and get back a asset that's worth billions. They're talking about one particular spot in Newport Beach where I think they want to put up 900 yeah. homes. Yeah. Um, the desalination uh, plant, that's something I actually need to do a show on because I'm, I'm, we need to talk about that at some point. We, it's beyond our scope of our discussion today. But, and I yes, don't know anything about it. Well, <laughs> and, but the questions that you bring up are valid and the fact that it's happening now, it's not, it's not an accident that it has occurred that way. Not an accident. Uh, one of the guys in the film, he, uh, Eric uh, Holt Jimenez, he's the head of Food First in Oakland, and he pointed out to me that he's worked with agricultural groups around the world and is very keyed into peasant groups and farming groups globally. And he pointed out to me that that land is at a premium right now. Oh yeah. And that it's tangible. It's real. It's tangible, and and that the economy is so stagnant that the companies that have lots of money and the people that have lots of money, they don't have a place to put it. So the safe harbor for the concentrated wealth of this era is going into land. So farmland in, you know, in Brazil, in Indonesia, California, wherever, this is a big target of, of the concentrated wealth because there is no, because the, the economy is stagnant. Wages are, are depressed or flat. So it doesn't make sense to build too many more consumer gadgets because people aren't buying them. 
So they need a place to shelter the money. Land is it. It makes sense to me. Todd, thank you so much for thank coming you. on today. I thoroughly Pleasure. enjoyed the film. I encourage you guys to check it out. It's Occupy the Farm and keep up with Todd's work. Um, what have you got going on next? What's next in the pipeline? Uh, I'm making a film right now about water. California's had a drought. Right and, on, brother. And, uh, we got to talk about that then. It's a, it's a, it's a story about a dam, one dam on one river that connects two communities that are 500 miles apart. And one of them is a very old community, and one of them is a relatively new one. And so it's, like, it's about the tension over this water between What's, these two Did you tell us the title, or? I don't, I don't have a title yet. Understood. All right. <laughs> well, I wish you luck. It, that is a, a great subject, and I will look forward to watching it. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been speaking with Todd Darling, and uh, this is a perfect example and is Occupy the Farm of Think Global, Act Local, because, ladies and gentlemen, we can do it. And as I say every week, and it is true, you me, every single one of us, we're the antidote.